The hero of this story one day suddenly found himself in front of a goddess after he died in his sleep. While the boy had not processed what just happened, the goddess told him that he would be reincarnated into a fantasy world, and his ability would be decided by playing a gacha draw. The goddess pushed him to draw the gacha that will determine his future, and he receives an ability called Toxin Decomposition, which could decompose any pathogen and neutralize any poison. Our protagonist does not like this skill, but the goddess tells him that it is a wonderful skill, and then sends him into the fantasy world, where he is reincarnated as Ain Roundheart, the son of an earl in the Him Kingdom. It has been five years since Ain was reincarnated into this world, and right now he has just tested out his toxin decomposition ability. He successfully decomposed some mold he scraped from outside, but as a side effect of using his ability, he feels dizzy and his head hurts, so he decides to never use this ability again. Then Ain runs outside since it is time for him to train with his dad. He swings his practice sword as his dad Logas, the Earl of the Roundheart family and a great general of the Him Kingdom, watches over him. Just then, Ain's stepmother Camilla and her son Grint also came to the training arena. Grint was one year younger than Ain, but he had much more talent when it came to swordsmanship, and that is why Logas always gave him preferential treatment. This upsets Ain, but he thinks it is fine since Grint has the ability to become a holy knight while he just had toxin purification. Embarrassed at his weakness, Ain decides to compensate for it by working hard in his studies. One evening, as he is lost in the mountain of books on his table, the family butler comes to the library and claims that Ain will become a great man because of his diligence. He reports that his mother has returned from a work trip, and Ain is overjoyed. He goes to meet his mother, Olivia, a beautiful woman who loves her son and who also runs a merchant company on her own. She is Ain's inspiration, and he strives to work hard and be like her. Olivia has a gift for her son, which is his status card that displays his stats, and Ain is elated to receive it. He doesn't know if his stats are good or bad, but Olivia assures him that his stats are much better than those of kids his age. Then Ain notices that apart from toxin purification, he has another ability called Gift of Training and learns that it boosts his growth and speeds up his recovery. After that, Olivia has to go to the market to select tea for the family. It was supposed to be a servant's job, but her mother-in-law had tasked her to do it, and Ain is upset on her behalf. She cheers him up by asking him to accompany her, and he eagerly joins her on the trip to the market. They reach a merchant's store, and while Olivia looks at the different types of tea leaves, Ain notices a magic stone among his goods. The merchant explains that magic stones were found when magic power condensed inside a monster's body. They were found in various sizes and grades, and some of them could be extremely toxic for humans but the one he has is harmless. Ain is curious about it, and the merchant lets him touch the magic stone. But the boy is not satisfied with just that because the stone smells extremely sweet, and he wonders if it tastes nice too. Since no one is looking at him, Ain licks the magic stone and finds that it tastes like honey, and he is blown away by its deliciousness. However, he immediately feels guilty for doing that and asks the merchant to sell it to him. Luckily, the merchant gives it to him for free, saying that it was a complimentary service for being his customer for so long. As they leave the shop, Ain notices that the magic stone has lost its color and become transparent. The next day, he finds himself brimming with energy while training his sword skills. He tries to hit the practice dummy to see if there is any difference, and he manages to tear it apart with a wooden sword. The soldier stationed nearby is shocked to see the incident before his eyes, but Ain is also equally in disbelief as he does not know that all his stats have gone up a notch. Soon, Ain and Olivia are going somewhere in a carriage, and she is furious at her husband. Today, a grand party was being thrown for the children of the nobles to be introduced to the high society, and Lovis had taken only Grint with him, and he planned to declare him as his heir and engage him with the daughter of a marquis. Ain does not care if he loses the succession battle to his half-brother, but seeing his mother upset, he also feels bad. His thoughts wander to the incident that happened the other day, and everyone dismissed his display of strength as the armor being worn out after months of use. However, Ain doesn't think that it was a mere coincidence, and he thinks that licking the magic stone might be the reason behind it. Ain and Olivia soon arrive at the mansion of the Archduke, where the party is being thrown. Logas, Camilla, and Grint say they have to greet the Marquis and tell Ain and his mother to go to the hall without them, but there is a shock waiting for them there. They learn that they are not invited to the party, as only one child could come per noble family unless prior permission was sought. Logas had named Grint as his son who would attend the party, and Ain is sure that Camilla had something to do with that. The receptionist who informs Olivia of this situation is as troubled as her, and to find a solution out of this messy situation. 
Ain exclaims that the garden outside is exquisite. He wants to take a stroll there and convinces his mother that he would rather enjoy a walk in the garden with her than attend the party. She is emotional and hugs him, while the receptionist gets permission from the Archduke to let them enter the garden. The Archduke also wants them to go along with a guide, and he has sent Claw and August, his granddaughter, for that task. Ain is taken aback when he sees the pretty Claw, and he apologizes for the mistake on their part that made them ineligible to enter the party. She guides Ain and Olivia through the garden and tells Olivia that she has always looked up to her. Meanwhile, Ain is mesmerized by the glowing flowers, and Claw recalls the rumors she had heard about him being arrogant and mannerless just now. She thinks that the rumors were completely baseless, as he was a true gentleman. Ain calls the blue roses in the garden beautiful, and Klon mistakes those words for being directed towards her and blushes. However, she understands the situation quickly and explains that the flowers are called blue fire roses, which glow by themselves. They are one of the most rare and beautiful flowers, but their thorn contains a deadly poison. But if that poison is drained once, the flower is said to turn into the most beautiful of all jewels. Ain is really shocked to hear that making the jewel called Star Crystal is really hard and the process is expensive, which is why there are only two such jewels in the entire kingdom. He suddenly gets the idea that his ability may allow him to achieve the same result, and by doing that, he can make his mother proud. Ain does not care about the side effects and asks Claire if she wants to see a blue rose jewel. She happily agrees, having no idea what he plans to do next. Ain uses this chance to pluck a flower even as Klon and Olivia scream at him to stop, and he uses his detoxification ability on it. He feels like he is taking a dip in a refreshing sea, and there are no side effects like there were before. Ain realizes that his skill is stronger against poison as compared to other things, and now he is confident in his abilities. The blue rose flower in his hand glows and turns into a jewel called Star Crystal. Ain presents it to Klon, saying that it was the jewel she has always dreamt of, and his mother is shocked by what he had just done. Ain fears that he used a corny line and wonders if Klon will laugh at him, but as he looks up, he finds her lost for words. She is hesitant but decides to take the flower, and he asks her permission to pluck another flower to make the jewel for his mom. After Ain gives Olivia a star crystal, Klon has to return to the party. But before going, she tells Ain that they will be on a first-name basis from now on, and there is no need for any formalities between them. After some time, Ain and Olivia go inside the hall since Logas is late, and they learn that he already went home without telling them. Olivia is shocked, and Ain thinks that it was because he is worthless in his father's eyes. Olivia comforts him and asks him if he likes his dad, and Ain clearly tells her that he is not fond of him. She is happy to hear it and tells her son that they should go to her father's land now, which was the most beautiful place in her eyes. Burning the wedding ring that Locas gave Olivia into a gush of ashes, Olivia tells the much astonished Ain that she does not need it now. She sends the message through a device for someone to take her and Ain back home. He was assuming they were moving to the mansion before the date changes, but he was surprised to see the carriage arriving at the port, where a majestic ship with cannons and tons of armored men was already waiting among the much kingdom's shocked crowd to receive them. The people were scared to see it, and they assumed that they were going to face an attack. An army of knights gets off the ship and surround Olivia and Ain, and he decides to save his mother from an incoming attack. But Olivia calms him down. Christina, a beautiful armored knight, comes forth and greets them, before she introduces herself, and that was the moment when Ain realized that this 200-meter-long ship with armored guards and a beautiful bodyguard was not a threat, but their amenity for taking them back home. This ship has come to take their princess Olivia back. Olivia realizes that Ain is confused and assures him to tell him everything once they reach her kingdom. Back in Archduke August's mansion, Graf August, the head of the August family, was discussing the events of the night with his granddaughter. He was concerned about the mistake made by his family and was impressed by the remarkable personality of Ain Roundheart. Klon shows him the star crystal that Ain gifted to her on the eve. August was still trying to figure out why Roundhearts had chosen the second child to be the next head instead of the deserving first son. He talks about the promise that they are intending to break if it happens. Klon asks about the promise, and August begins with the story of their relationship with another kingdom, which Klon must keep secret. The story is about the continent of Ishtar, which was only two days away from the port city of Roundheart when taking a ship. There is only one kingdom on that island, the United Nation, Ishtalika, a kingdom so great that Roundheart doesn't stand a single chance to win against it and Olivia is the daughter of the current king of that kingdom, Silvered von Ishtalika, 
and the second princess of Ishtalika, which simply means she is royalty. Both Ain and Klon are surprised on learning this at their respective places. Olivia knows that her son is startled to hear this, so she apologizes to him for hiding her true identity from him. Ain asks her mother why she married into the Roundheart family when she was royalty. Olivia was about to explain when Chris stopped her angrily from revealing any other truth. Olivia makes a pout at her scolding and hugs Ain, but he is happy to see her mother acting this frank and relaxed after so long. Olivia promises Ain that she will tell him everything when the time is right. Chris asks Olivia about that star crystal she was holding in her hands and whether she had received it from the Roundhearts, and Olivia tells her that Ain gifted it to her. Chris says that makes sense as to why Olivia is holding that crystal so dearly. It is said that gifting a star crystal to your opposite gender means proposing to them. Ain now realizes that, unknowingly, he had proposed to Claw in August, and that was why she had reacted a little awkwardly before accepting the gift. Now Ain is blushing at what he has done, and both Olivia and Chris are smiling at his cuteness. Olivia then asks Chris when they will be arriving in the capital, and she replies that they will arrive around 11 a.m. after traveling on the water train from the port. Ain asks about that train, and Chris explains to him that this water train works by heating up the water produced by the magic crystal and working on the steam. Ain now understands that the system works on a steam engine, which is much different than him kingdom. Both Olivia and Chris are impressed by his knowledge, and Olivia proudly hugs him again. Little do they know that this knowledge is from his past life and was almost about to be revealed. The ship was enormous and lavish, and Ain is still figuring out the lifestyle his life has been devoid of. From changing clothes to food and sleep, everything was beyond his imagination. Later, in the port of Ishtalika, he sees demi-humans for the first time, and exclaims that everything was so different and surprising in Ishtalika. Olivia explains that there were demons, elves, beastmen, and several other races in the Ishtalika kingdom, which makes it different from other places. The kingdom was enormous and densely crowded, and in the midst of the capital city stood the Grand Palace. Christina announces her arrival at the palace gates as the Imperial Guard Knight Vice Captain. Ain finds her personality cool, but Olivia chuckles as she claims that she is a bit ditzy. All of a sudden, Chris suddenly stumbles and almost falls, and Olivia's statement finally makes sense to Ain. Olivia asks Chris whether she has told her father, the king, of her return. Chris says since it was a sudden message, she hasn't informed him yet. Even March has ordered everyone to act normally after seeing Olivia to not divert the king from his work. Ain inquires about March, and Olivia tells him that March was the servant who took care of her who sometimes is a little scary but good. She states that she will introduce Ain to her later, and he has an image of a strict old maid in his mind. On reaching a grand door, Chris suggests that they should meet the king later, as he might be busy with a meeting being held behind that door. But Olivia barges in towards her father, announcing her arrival. The king is sitting with several other important people, discussing something serious. Chris and Ain try to stop Olivia, but they are already late. Their unannounced entry earns them stares from everyone and now Ain is facing his grandfather, the king of Ishtalika. The king has an intimidating and pressurizing aura, and Ain feels nervous while facing him. The king seems serious, demanding the reason for his daughter's presence in her father's country rather than the kingdom she was married into. He also wants to know about the boy, and Olivia gives Ain courage to introduce himself. He was initially nervous finally introduces himself, stating Roundheart as his previous family name. The mood completely changes after Ain introduces himself, and the king of Ishtalika smiles as he introduces himself as Ain's grandfather. Lloyd Galatia, a well-trained soldier and the Grand Marshal of the kingdom also greets him. Following up Ain's statement about stating Roundheart as his previous family name, Silvered comes to know that his daughter has been divorced and won't be going to him anymore. Shocked over hearing this, he asks Lloyd to punch him in the face, assuming he might be daydreaming, but the knight confirms the news. The king immediately demands the reason, and Olivia tells him that it was only for the sake of Ain that she came here. Things were not going in his favor there, and Ain could never be happy in that environment. Silvered and Lloyd are shocked and angry to hear this. The king dismisses the meeting, and tells the officials strictly not to tell anybody about what had been discussed here. Then, he calls two important people called Warren and Kadima so that Olivia can explain exactly what happened to everyone. She tells them that they were treated unjustly and how the Roundhearts decided Grint would be the next family head. Lloyd and Silvered get angry on hearing this, and a dangerous aura starts emanating from them. The king asks Lloyd to prepare for an expedition, and he is ready enough to finish off Lovis, who is like a pitiful knight to him. 
Olivia calms them down, claiming that they don't have to worry about him anymore. Furthermore, they were not allowed to invade them because of the first king's promise. Chadima von Ishtalika, the talking cat demi-human, is the first princess of the kingdom. Considering what she has heard about the incident, Kadima says that Ain being excluded from being the next head of the family only because of his ability represents an archaic way of thinking of the Roundhearts. Olivia asks for her father's permission so that she can explain to Ain why exactly she happened to marry in the kingdom of him despite being a princess of such a grand kingdom. The king gives her the permission, as the promise made years ago has been broken. Warren Lark, the Stalika's prime minister, starts telling the story. The main reason behind Olivia marrying Logas of the Him Kingdom was that the Him Kingdom possesses the much-wanted sea crystal, which is made from the bones of sea monsters living inside the ocean of that kingdom. In Ishtalika, these crystals are used to make magic tools. Magic tools made in other countries never use these sea crystals, because their magic was too difficult to control and could harm the users. In Ishtalika, the superior technology allowed sea crystals to be used to control the magical power of the magic stones when used while making tools. All of the sea crystals of Ishtalika were mined earlier, so it was important to import them from other countries. Ain realizes that his mother married in the kingdom of him only for the sake of her people, and Olivia replies that it is the duty of a royal. She further explains that in return for receiving the crystals from the state, Ishtalika promised the security of the people of him with the promise that, in the future, Olivia's first son would become the head of the family and get promoted to a duke once he reaches adulthood. Silvered thought that this was the best decision for the kingdom as a sea dragon was approaching, and he was assured since his daughter and grandson would be away in a much safer place in him. Lloyd recommends that they start searching for new sources of sea crystals right away, but Olivia interrupts him. She was already working and investigating about potential sources in the kingdom, and she has found one. She had made requests through merchant associations and adventurer guilds while running her business and found a place that could sell them the sea crystals. Olivia hands over the research report to Warren. That informs that a country called Euro had good sea crystal reserves. The king thought that they had already checked this place, but he is amazed when he learns that the sea crystals found at the depths of the ocean were rising up to the surface in Euro. Olivia has been doing all this research, while hiding her true identity under the newly formed Merchants Association, and everyone is amazed at her resourcefulness. Ain remembers how dedicated her mother has been to all of her duties. People loved and respected her as the wife of an earl. Even after the birth of Grint, as she started to face all of the injustice, she never forgot to smile. She was always working, yet she always took out time for Ain out of her busy schedule. The king feels sorry that her daughter has been pressured to do all this by herself, but Oliver comforts him, saying that he is not required to feel like this. She claims that Ain is her everything, and she can do anything for him. Silver decides to celebrate and honor Olivia for her sacrifices and hard work. As soon as the king demands it, Warren gives him a document with the queen's permission. The king, Olivia, and Kadima sign over that document, with Lloyd and Warren serving as witnesses. Warren starts reading that document, and Ain is not sure about what is going to happen next. With that, the king announces in front of all the witnesses that Ain would be the royalty of the kingdom of Ishtalika, and, from now on, he will be called Ain von Ishtalika, the crown prince of the great kingdom. Ain finds it hard to believe, and he thinks that if he told this story to anyone, he would just be mocked. From being an unloved son of an earl, with no one acknowledging him and his efforts, and later being dethroned from the line of family heirs, he suddenly became the crown prince of Ishtalika overnight. In the capital city, everybody is talking about the return of Olivia and Prince Ain, and they are excited to meet their crown prince. Back in the castle, Ain is training with Lloyd. Though Lloyd compliments his efforts and swordsmanship, Ain is still not sure whether he would ever be accepted as a crown prince. He feels he could easily get defeated by his younger brother, Grint. Despite all of his efforts, his father never acknowledged him, and before he could do anything, Olivia brought her back. He is questioning his worth as a prince of Estalica when Lloyd stops him in the middle. He draws his attention to his torn cloth, and in a few seconds, he draws out his stitching kit and mends the torn shirt flawlessly. Ain is surprised by his actions, and Lloyd explains to him that the skill he got at birth was sewing. It seemed embarrassing to have a skill like that with a build like his, so he practiced hard to become the Grand Marshal. Lloyd declares that it doesn't matter how great one's skills are, because everyone has to work hard if they want to achieve something. He tells Ain that effort is the real treasure that can help him through everything. Then Kadima suddenly appears and takes Ain with her to her room, where Chris is also waiting for them. Kadima examines Ain's status cards, which reveal his abilities have increased and he has a new skill called absorbing. 
Kadima explains that Sinsane is the son of Olivia, who is a dryad, it is his characteristic racial feature. He is amazed, as this is the first time someone has told him about Olivia being a dryad. Ain only knows dryads from the fantasy stories of his previous life where they are considered to be tree spirits. Kadima laughs at him and taunts him, saying that soon he will be able to grow roots, just like his mother. Then she explains that the kingdom has had multiple races as royals in history, and the race of a child is not decided before it is born. Silvert is a human, but Kadima is a cat sith, and Olivia is a dryad. Ain thinks that even the lineage system of royalty here was a gacha system. Coming to the topic of the hike in Ain's stats, Kadima reveals that he has been absorbing the magical powers of magic stones, and that is why his status is improving so quickly. Monsters eat magic stones to improve their power, but since they have toxins, they are poisonous to humans, who cannot copy the same method. But because Ain has the toxin decomposition skill, those poisons don't harm him. Kadima asks him if he can tell her anything about it, and Ain tells the story of licking the magic stone that tasted like honey. He says that it was a cheap magic stone and he has not absorbed the power of another magic stone since then, so he couldn't have grown powerful because of that. To this, Chris replies that Ain is probably absorbing the magic stone inside her. Ain is flustered as he hears this, and Chris explains that she is a demi-human and an elf, and all demi-humans have a magic stone inside them. Kadima then brings her collection of cheap and costly magic stones. They start the trial of Ain's abilities with cheaper ones and then move on to the costly ones. The stones become discolored after Ain absorbs the power by licking them. Kadima explains that absorbing power increases Ain's stats along with his skills. Better quality stones will increase the status of Ain much more than cheaper ones, and they will also add to his skills. Plus, since he has the skill and gift of training, it lessens the illness Ain gets after using the toxin decomposition skill each time. Soon, Olivia comes there to check up on her son and Kadima assures her that Ain is normal, and there is not any problem with him. She is relieved and takes Ain to meet Silvert outside the castle's treasure room. The king says that Olivia earlier asked for an apology and a reward for what she has been through, and she wants him to gift Ain something for that. That is why, he is taking him to Estalica's national treasure, Dullahan's magic stone. Dullahan was one of the generals of an extremely powerful demon king, who attacked the kingdom 500 years ago. Estalica's first king defeated that demon lord, and he was hailed as a hero by the entire world. Ain is overwhelmed as he hears the tale of the hero, and nervously goes near the magic stone. The toxic aura of the magic stone has no effect on Ain because of his power, and he can feel the enormous power radiating from the stone. As soon as he touches it, the stone seems to recognize him, and says, You have returned. The stone releases its power in a violent outburst, and he feels like instead of him absorbing it, the power was coming towards him on its own. The power starts entering inside Ain's body, and then with a blinding light, everything is completed. Nothing can be seen about what was happening through the smoke and strong winds, but then Ain emerges from the smoke, his body overflowing with power. His stats have jumped way beyond what they previously were with one more skill being added called the Black Knight. Back in the August mansion of Him Kingdom, Klon is on her balcony, and she remembers Ain by holding the star crystal in her hands. The girl appears to be in love as she is caressing the crystal. A servant enters the room and asks her about the homework assigned by her father. Klon says she has already finished it in two days, and the maid is astonished as it was a week's worth of homework. But Klon asks her to tell her father to give something more tough as this one was easy. The servant then tells her that his grandfather has asked her to write that person a letter. Klon knows that he was referring to Ain, so she rushes to bring a pen and paper but wonders what to write. The maid suggests getting help from her grandpa, and Klon immediately runs to him. Back in the castle of Ishtalika, the king is pleased to observe the stats of Ain, which have increased after absorbing the demonic magic stone's power. He tells Ain never to not get carried away by his stats since he needs more training to use that power efficiently. Then he moves to Olivia and says that he knows that this was all Olivia's plan before getting divorced. She has planned all that happened today because, as Ain's mother, she was always well aware of his powers. Olivia confesses the truth and says that right after getting married into the Roundheart family, the late head of the Roundhearts died, whom they trusted the most. At first, she fulfilled her job as royal, but later on, she was not very sure about the future. Hence, she could not gather courage to commit to root with Logas, or in other words, she did not dare to get physical with him. Silvered knows what that means, and Olivia confirms his doubts, claiming that she gave birth to Ain as a dryad. 
It was the truth that Olivia had planned for everything right after she started thinking of divorce. She apologizes to her father for not telling him the truth, and he is shocked to hear it. Silvered pats Olivia's shoulder and asks Ain to move out of place as they have to discuss something important and his presence would be inappropriate there. Ain goes to see Warren and Kadima and the Kadima says that she had been suspecting the birth of Ain as a dryad, since the chances of a child having the same race as his parent was very rare in the complex bloodlines of royalty. Warren says that it was a mistake on their part that they married Olivia to the Roundhearts. Ain still could not understand anything and he asks what the word root means. Kadima gets straight to the point and says that root means to make a child. It makes Warren spit his tea in shock, and he tells her to explain it to Ain in a little less absurd manner since he was a kid, and she says that dryads are very particular about the people they get close to. According to Kadima, dryads can have a serious relationship with only one person for their whole life. It also means sharing their life with them, and giving birth is an even more serious for dryads. Ain asks Warren whether it is true, and Warren confirms it. Kadima snaps at him for not trusting her enough, and then Ain asks how he was born if Olivia did not root with Locas. Kadima explains that dryads have complex characteristics, and they are allowed to give birth only once without the help of the opposite gender, which means Ain has been born out of her stem, that is, he was born only from Olivia and not Locas. Also, Dryads have unique hypnotizing skills that made Olivia hypnotize Locas and never submit to his needs. And because of that skill, Locas would never have realized the truth. Warren says that it would have been a very hard decision for Olivia to make, since as a royal, she could neither take her relationship lightly nor remain without bearing an offspring to the kingdom. Ain now understands what her mother has been through, and he thinks that she doesn't owe an explanation or obligation to anyone. Ain is relieved that no one would ever blame Olivia, but then all of a sudden, his stomach starts to growl, and he shyly admits that he is hungry. Kadima alerts him to never go near the audience while he is hungry, as he could unknowingly absorb the energy from that stone. Warren says that in the audience hall, the Demon King's magic stone has been put for decoration, and it would be a bad thing if Ain absorbed its power. Ain is shocked to hear that it was the magic stone of the Demon King that was defeated by the first king. Talking about the first king, Ain asks whether they are talking about the same person who defeated the demon king and is regarded as a hero by everyone. Warren says he was acknowledged by everyone throughout the world, not only for his strength but also for his kind heart. Ain confesses his feelings to Warren and Kadima, and says that although his mother has done a lot for him, he has never done anything for her until now. Though he has now become a crown prince and his status has increased because of that national treasure magic stone, he is still unable to get over this feeling. He wants to show the Roundheart family, who have treated his mother so badly and never acknowledged him, what he is capable of by becoming a great king, just like the first king of Ishtalika. He asks if it's rude of him to say all this, but they say that it is perfectly fine. Warren declares that he will do whatever he can to help Ayn reach his goal. He suggests that Ayn's swordsmanship lessons should be continued by Lloyds and Chris, whereas he would take care of his studies. Kadima holds his hands and pulls him towards the study room, asking him to show his gained power from Dunghan's stone, as she would be in charge of checking his magical powers. As they leave, Warren chuckles and says that Ayn resembles the first king a lot. Eight months have passed, and summer has come to Ishtalika. Ain, along with Chris and Lloyd, has entered a dense forest. Lloyd tells Ain that today's training is about fighting off the forest monsters, who, unlike the palace guards, will really try to kill him, so he cautions him to not let his guard down for a single second. The first monster is a forest rat, and as soon as Chris starts explaining how to start the fight, Ain tells her that it is okay and asks her to let him think about how to fight him off. Chris is agitated a bit, and Lloyd chuckles. Ain notices the sharp claws and fangs of that rat, which could hurt if it wounds him. The rat jumps on him, but with one blow of his sword, he kills it and tosses it to the ground easily. Then more monsters appears, and Ain fights all of them impressively. After Ain has defeated a pile of those monsters, Lloyd boasts that there might be no monsters at all in the forest who would be his perfect match. But Chris asks Ain not to let his guard down, and suddenly one of the defeated monsters uses its remaining energy to attack him from behind. Chris draws her sword, but Lloyd stops her. A sting-like limb emerges from Ain's back and takes down the monster. Ain says that it is the Phantom's Hand, the skill he has acquired from the Dullahan's magic stone. It is the only skill from the Black Knight ability he has been able to use in these eight months. He can even alter the length and thickness of that hand by controlling his magic, and with the help of a powerful artifact that Kadima has designed, it can draw the magic stone from the enemy's heart, even if it is not dead. 
Chris is amazed and horrified to see the sight of the pitch black straw extracting magic stone from the body of the monster. Later, while returning to the castle, Ain notices a strange shop in the lane from the carriage, and he inquires about that shop. Chris says that it is the well-known magic stone shop, Magolus from which all the magic stones used in the castle are purchased. Lloyd asks Ain whether he would like to visit the shop, and he gets excited. Lloyd cannot accompany him in his uniform, and instructs Chris to not reveal the real identity of Ain, as the official announcement of the prince returning to the kingdom has not been made yet. Both Chris and Ain drape a cloak around them, and Chris wears a helmet. An excited Ain enters the shop, and the shop master, with an absurd dress and thick makeup, welcomes his little curious customer. The shop owner of this magic stone shop is a lady wearing extreme suspenders. Half of her head is shaved in a boy-cut hairstyle. The other half is long strands of hair with two stripes of black hair. Ain is confused when he sees the shop owner, who looks like a drag queen, but Chris tells him that despite his weird tastes, the shopkeeper Majolis is very kind and he doesn't have to worry about anything. She assures Ain that though the shop owner seems a bit peculiar, he owns a renowned magic stone shop. The shop owner recognizes Chris, so she removes her helmet and answers sheepishly that it has been a while since she has met him. Najolis welcomes Chris, as he had earlier assumed that she had come to play a prank on him but instead had visited as a bodyguard to the boy. Ain says that he has visited that shop as he wishes to take a look at all the magic stones they have. Majolis is amazed to hear that, and says that Ain has a great hobby at such a young age, and they can both become great friends. Majolis tells him that he is free to take a look around but should not be touching any of those stones or crystals with directly, as these can harm him. Ain starts taking a look around at all these stones. Earlier, he used to get enticed easily by the smell of stones, but now, after absorption suppression training, these stones have little effect over him. Suddenly, he detects a steak-like smell coming from a stone. He asks whether it is steak, to which the Majolus replies that this stone is from a white wyvern, whose meat is used for making fine quality steak. He asks him whether he is interested in that. Ain gives him a lukewarm response, because he can't really say that he would like to eat it. Majolus offers him a discounted price of 30,000 G instead of its marked price of 450,000 G. Without even thinking much, Ain buys it, and Chris is surprised. She asks him about the money, and Ain replies that his grandpa has given him some pocket money as an allowance. Chris then secretively asks him to be careful about not revealing his true identity and magical powers. Ain agrees, and then starts buying the stones, even those worth 100 grams. Chris is astonished by the amount the king has given to Ain and that he has been spending this much. Majolus asks them to wait as he goes to pack all of that purchased stuff. Ain is happy and excited, saying he can't wait enough to absorb all the powers he could get from all those stones. Suddenly, he notices an unusual stone kept under a protected casement. Noticing his curiosity, Majolus tells them about the stone that is called the Accursed Jewel. It is said that it haunts its owner in their dreams, crying out that they are not the one. That display case has been specially made in order to seal its powers. Ain wonders whether Kadama would be able to figure out the secret behind it, as the stone doesn't appear evil to him. And Majolis also says that it is absurd for a stone to talk. Ain asks whether he could sell it off to him with the case, but Chris asks him to be cautious before something bad happens. Majolis says that it seems that Ain is not enticed by it, and Ain confirms that he is buying it willingly. Majolis tells him that he will only charge him for the case, which would be 300,000 G, and asks Ain to bring it back if he notices something absurd happening. Chris wants to stop him but she can refuse when Ain looks at her with a sad expression. She accidentally says that the king will probably approve of the purchase since Majolis is the one who sealed the stone. Majolis again starts wrapping up the purchase, and Ain is having a look at other stones in the meantime. The shop owner tells Chris that the new crown prince is quite a daring one. Chris is stunned and starts acting sheepishly, claiming that she doesn't know what he is talking about. But Majolis asks her not to act like that, as she just mentioned the king's name. Chris pleads with him not to disclose it to anyone and to keep this a secret, and he has no intention to spread this news around. With this, Ain's first shopping trip to the Magic Stone shop is concluded, and he returns home satisfied. With this, the video ends. Tell us what do you think about this story, and if you want to see more of it, leave a comment. To see more videos like this, subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss our content.